This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, please visit LibriVox.blogsome.com. Today's reading by Alex Foster, www.alexfoster.me.uk. An International Episode by Henry James. LibriVox, Section 1. Part 1. Four years ago, in 1874, two young Englishmen had occasion to go to the United States. They crossed the ocean at midsummer, and, arriving in New York on the first day of August, were much struck with the fervid temperature of that city. Disembarking upon the wharf, they climbed into one of those huge, high-hung coaches which conveyed passengers to the hotels, and, with a great deal of bouncing and bumping, took their course through Broadway. The midsummer aspect of New York is not, perhaps, the most favourable one. Still, it is not without its picturesque and even brilliant side. Nothing could well resemble less a typical English street than the interminable avenue, rich in incongruities, through which our two travellers advanced, looking out on each side of them at the comfortable animation of the sidewalks, the high-coloured heterogeneous architecture, the huge white marble façades glittering in the strong crude light, and bedizened with gilding letters, the multifarious awnings, banners and streamers, the extraordinary number of omnibuses, horse-cars, and other democratic vehicles, the vendors of cooling fluids, and white trousers, and big straw hats of the policemen, the tripping gait of the modish young persons on the pavement, the general brightness, newness, juvenility, both of people and things. The young men had exchanged few observations, but in crossing Union Square in front of the monument to Washington, in the very shadow indeed projected by the image of the pater patriae, one of them remarked to the other, It seems a rum-looking place. Ah, oh, very odd, very odd, said the other, who was the clever man of the two. Pity it's so beastly hot, resumed the first speaker after a pause. You know, we are in a low latitude, said his friend. I dare say, remarked the other. I wonder, said the second speaker presently, if they can give one a bath. I dare say not, rejoined the other. Oh, I say, cried his comrade. This animated discussion was checked by their arrival at the hotel, which had been recommended to them by an American gentleman whose acquaintance they made, with whom indeed they became very intimate, on the steamer, and who had proposed to accompany them to the inn and introduce them in a friendly way to the proprietor. This plan, however, had been defeated by their friends finding that his partner was waiting for him on the wharf, and that his commercial associate desired him instantly to come and give his attention to certain telegrams received from St. Louis. But the two Englishmen, with nothing but their national prestige and personal graces to recommend them, were very well received at the hotel, which had an air of capacious hospitality. They found that a bath was not unattainable, and were indeed struck with the facilities for prolonged and reiterated immersion with which their apartment was supplied. After bathing a good deal, more indeed than they had ever done before on a single occasion, they made their way into the dining-room of the hotel which was a spacious restaurant with a fountain in the middle, a great many tall plants in ornamental tubs, and an array of French waiters. The first dinner on land, after a sea voyage, is, under any circumstances, a delightful occasion, and there was something particularly agreeable in the circumstances in which our young Englishmen found themselves. They were extremely good-natured young men. They were more observant than they appeared. In a sort of inarticulate, accidentally dissimulative fashion, they were highly appreciative. This was perhaps especially the case with the elder, who was also, as I have said, the man of talent. They sat down at a little table, which was a very different affair from the great clattering seesaw in the saloon of the steamer. The wide doors and windows of the restaurant stood open, beneath large awnings, to a wide pavement, where there were other plants in tubs and rows of spreading trees, and beyond which there was a large shady square, without any palings, and with marble paved walks and above the vivid verdure rose other façades of white marble and of pale chocolate-coloured stone, squaring themselves against the deep blue sky. Here, outside, in the light and the shade and the heat, there was a great tinkling of the bells of innumerable street-cars, and a constant strolling and shuffling and rustling of many pedestrians, a large proportion of whom were young women in pompadour-looking dresses. Within, the place was cool and vaguely lighted, with the plash of water, the odour of flowers, and the flitting of French waiters, as I have said, upon sandless carpets. "'It's rather like Paris, you know,' said the younger of our two travellers. 
"'It's like Paris, only more so,' his companion rejoined. "'I suppose it's the French waiters,' said the first speaker. "'Why don't they have French waiters in London?' "'Fancy a French waiter at a club,' said his friend. The young Englishman started a little, as if he could not fancy it. "'In Paris I am very apt to dine at a place where there's an English waiter. "'Don't you know what's his name, close to Thingamibob? "'They always set an English waiter at me. "'I suppose they think I can't speak French. "'Well, you can't.' "'And the elder of the young Englishman unfolded his napkin. "'His companion took no notice whatever of this declaration. "'I say,' he resumed in a moment, "'I suppose we must learn to speak American. "'I suppose we must take lessons.' "'I can't understand them,' said the clever man. "'What the deuce is he saying?' asked his comrade, appealing from the French waiter. "'He is recommending some soft-shell crabs,' said the clever man. And so, in desultory observation of the idiosyncrasies of the new society in which they found themselves, the young Englishman proceeded to dine, going in largely, as the phrase is, for cooling draughts and dishes, of which their attendant offered them a very long list. After dinner, they went out and slowly walked about the neighbouring streets. The early dusk of waning summer was coming on, but the heat was still very great. The pavements were hot even to the stout boot soles of the British travellers, and the trees along the curbstone emitted strange exotic odours. The young men wandered through the adjoining square, that queer place without palings, and with marble walks arranged in black and white lozenges. There were a great many benches, crowded with shabby-looking people, and the travellers remarked, very justly, that it was not much like Belgrave Square. On one side was an enormous hotel, lifting up into the hot darkness an immense array of open, brightly lighted windows. At the base of this populous structure was an eternal jangle of horse-cars, and all around it, in the upper dusk, was a sinister hum of mosquitoes. The ground floor of the hotel seemed to be a huge, transparent cage, flinging a wide glare of gaslight into the street, of which it formed a sort of public adjunct, absorbing and emitting the passers-by promiscuously. The young Englishman went in with everyone else, from curiosity, and saw a couple of hundred men sitting on divans along a great marble-paved corridor, with their legs stretched out, together with several dozen more standing in a queue, as at the ticket office of a railway station, before a brilliantly illuminated counter of vast extent. These latter persons, who carried portmanteaus in their hands, had a dejected, exhausted look. Their garments were not very fresh, and they seemed to be rendering some mysterious tribute to a magnificent young man with a waxed moustache and a shirt-front adorned with diamond buttons, who, every now and then, dropped an absent glance over their multitudinous patients. They were American citizens doing homage to a hotel clerk. "'I'm glad he didn't tell us to go there,' said one of our Englishmen, alluding to their friend on the steamer who had told them so many things." They walked up the Fifth Avenue, where, for instance, he had told them that all the first families lived. But the first families were out of town, and our young travellers had only the satisfaction of seeing some of the second, or perhaps even the third, taking the evening air upon balconies and high flights of doorsteps, in the streets which radiate from the more ornamental thoroughfare. They went a little way down one of these side streets, and they saw young ladies in white dresses, charming-looking persons, seated in graceful attitudes on the chocolate-coloured steps. In one or two places these young ladies were conversing across the street with other young ladies seated in similar postures and costumes in front of the opposite houses, and in the warm night air their colloquial tones sounded strange in the ears of the young Englishman. One of our friends, nevertheless, the younger one, intimated that he felt a disposition to interrupt a few of these soft familiarities, but his companion observed, pertinently enough, that he had better be careful. "'We must not begin with making mistakes,' said his companion." "'But he told us, you know, he told us,' urged the young man, alluding again to the friend on the steamer. "'Never mind what he told us,' answered his comrade, who, if he had greater talents, was also apparently more of a moralist. By bedtime, in their impatience to taste of a terrestrial couch again, our seafarers went to bed early. It was still insufferably hot, and the buzz of the mosquitoes at the open windows might have passed for an audible crepitation of the temperature.' "'We can't stand this, you know,' the young Englishmen said to each other, and they tossed about all night more boisterously than they had tossed upon the Atlantic billows. On the morrow, their first thought was that they would re-embark that day for England, and then it occurred to them that they might find an asylum near at hand. The cave of Aeolus became their ideal of comfort, 
and they wondered where the Americans went when they wished to cool off. They had not the least idea, and they determined to apply for information to Mr. J. L. Westgate. This was the name inscribed in a bold hand on the back of a letter carefully preserved in the pocket-book of our junior traveller. Beneath the address, in the left-hand corner of the envelope, were the words, Introducing Lord Lambeth and Percy Beaumont, Esquire. The letter had been given to the two Englishmen by a good friend of theirs in London, who had been in America two years previously, and had singled out Mr. J. L. Westgate from the many friends he had left there, as the consignee, as it were, of his compatriots. "'He is a capital fellow,' the Englishman in London had said, "'and he has got an awfully pretty wife. "'He's tremendously hospitable. "'He will do everything in the world for you, "'and as he knows everyone over there, "'it is quite needless I should give you any other introduction. "'He will make you see everyone. "'Trust to him for putting you into circulation. "'He's got a tremendously pretty wife.' "'It was natural that in the hour of tribulation "'Lord Lambeth and Mr. Percy Beaumont "'should have befought themselves of a gentleman "'whose attractions had been thus vividly depicted.' all the more so that he lived in the Fifth Avenue, and that the Fifth Avenue, as they had ascertained the night before, was contiguous to their hotel. Ten to one he'll be out of town,' said Percy Beaumont, "'but we can at least find out where he has gone, and we can immediately start in pursuit. He can't possibly have gone to a hotter place, you know.' "'Oh, there's only one hotter place,' said Lord Lambeth, "'and I hope he hasn't gone there.' They strolled along the shady side of the street to the number indicated upon the precious letter. The house presented an imposing, chocolate-coloured expanse, relieved by facings and window cornices of florid sculpture, and by a couple of dusty rose-trees which clambered over the balconies and the portico. This last-mentioned feature was approached by a monumental flight of steps. "'Rather better than a London house,' said Lord Lambeth, looking down from this altitude, after they had rung the bell. "'It depends upon what London house you mean,' replied his companion. "'You have a tremendous chance to get wet between the house-door and your carriage.' Well, said Lord Lambeth, glancing at the burning heavens, I guess it doesn't rain so much here. The door was opened by a long negro in a white jacket, who grinned familiarly when Lord Lambeth asked for Mr. Westgate. He ain't at home, sir. He's downtown at his office. Oh, at his office, said the visitors. And when will he be home? Well, sir, when he goes out this way in the morning, he ain't liable to come home all day. This was discouraging but the address of Mr. Westgate's office was freely imparted by the intelligent black, and was taken down by Percy Beaumont in his pocket-book. The two gentlemen then returned, languidly, to their hotel, and sent for a hackney coach, and in this commodious vehicle they rolled comfortably downtown. They measured the whole length of Broadway again, and found it a path of fire, and then, deflecting to the left, they were deposited by their conductor before a fresh, light, ornamental structure ten stories high, in a street crowded with keen-faced, light-limbed young men, who were running about very quickly and stopping each other eagerly at corners and in doorways. Passing into this brilliant building, they were introduced by one of the keen-faced young men, he was a charming fellow, in wonderful cream-coloured garments, and a hat with a blue ribbon, who had evidently perceived them to be aliens and helpless, to a very snug hydraulic elevator, in which they took their place with many other persons, and which, shooting upward in its vertical socket, presently projected them into the seventh horizontal compartment of the edifice. Here, after brief delay, they found themselves face to face with the friend of their friend in London. His office was composed of several different rooms, and they waited very silently in one of them, after they had sent in their letter and their cards. Their letter was not one which it would take Mr. Westgate very long to read, but he came out to speak to them more instantly than they would have expected. He had evidently jumped up from his work. He was a tall, lean personage, and was dressed all in fresh white linen. He had a thin, sharp, familiar face, with an expression that was at one at the same time sociable and businesslike, a quick, intelligent eye, and a large brown moustache, which concealed his mouth, and made his chin beneath it look small. Lord Lambeth thought he looked tremendously clever. "'How do you do, Lord Lambeth? How do you do, sir?' he said, holding the open letter in his hand. "'I'm very glad to see you here. I hope you're very well.' "'You had better come in here. I think it's cooler.' And he led the way into another room, where there were law books and papers, and windows wide open beneath striped awning. Just opposite one of the windows, on a line with his eyes, Lord Lambeth observed the weather vane of a church steeple. The uproar of the street sounded infinitely far below, and Lord Lambeth felt very high in the air. "'I say it's cooler,' pursued their host, "'but everything is relative. How do you stand the heat?' "'I can't say we like it,' said Lord Lambeth. "'But Beaumont likes it better than I. 
"'Well, it won't last,' Mr. Westgate very cheerfully declared. "'Nothing unpleasant lasts over here. "'It was very hot when Captain Littledale was here. "'He did nothing but drink sherry cobblers. "'He expressed some doubt in his letter whether I will remember him, "'as if I don't remember making six sherry cobblers for him one day in about twenty minutes. "'I hope you left him well, two years having elapsed since then.' "'Oh, yes, he's all right,' said Lord Lambeth. "'I'm always very glad to see your countrymen,' Mr. Westgate pursued. "'I thought it would be time some of you should be coming along.' A friend of mine was saying to me only the other day, it's time for the watermelons and the Englishmen. The Englishmen and the watermelons, just now, are about the same thing, Percy Beaumont observed, wiping his dripping forehead. Ah, well, we'll put you on ice, as we do the melons. You must go down to Newport. We'll go anywhere, said Lord Lambeth. Yes, you want to go to Newport. It's what you want to do, Mr. Westgate affirmed. But let's see, when did you get here? Only yesterday, said Percy Beaumont. "'Ah, yes, by the Russia. Where are you staying?' "'At the Hanover, I think they call it.' "'Pretty comfortable?' inquired Mr. Westgate. "'It seems a capital place, but I can't say we like the gnats,' said Lord Lambeth. Mr. Westgate stared and laughed. "'Oh, no, of course you don't like the gnats. We shall expect you to like a good many things over here, but we shan't insist on your liking the gnats. Although certainly you'll admit that as gnats they are fine, eh?' "'But you oughtn't to remain in the city.' "'So we think,' said Lord Lambeth. "'If you would kindly suggest something.' "'Suggest something, my dear sir?' And Mr. Westgate looked at him, narrowing his eyelids. "'Open your mouth and shut your eyes. "'Leave it to me, and I'll put you through. "'It's a matter of national pride with me "'that all Englishmen should have a good time, "'and as I have had considerable practice, "'I have learned to minister to their wants. "'I find they generally want the right thing. "'So just please to consider yourselves my property.' And if anyone should try to appropriate, you please say, hands off, too late for the market. But let's see, continued the American, in his slow, humorous voice, with a distinctness of utterance which appeared to his visitors to be a part of humorous intention, a strangely leisurely speculative voice for a man evidently so busy, and, as they felt, so professional. Let's see, are you going to make something of a stay, Lord Lambeth? Oh, dear no, said the young Englishman. My cousin was coming over on some business, so I just came across at an hour's notice for the lark. "'Is it your first visit to the United States?' "'Oh, dear, yes.' "'I was obliged to come on some business,' said Percy Beaumont, "'and I brought Lambeth along. "'And you have never been here before, sir?' "'Never, never.' "'I thought from you referring to business,' said Mr. Westgate. "'Oh, you see, I'm by way of being a barrister,' Percy Beaumont answered. "'I know some people think that bringing a suit against of one of your railways, "'and they asked me to come over and take measures accordingly. "'What's your railroad?' he asked. The Tennessee Central. The American tilted back his chair a little and poised it at an instant. Well, I'm sorry you want to attack one of our institutions, he said, smiling. But I guess you had better enjoy yourself first. I'm certainly rather afraid I can't work in this weather, the young barrister confessed. Leave that to the natives, said Mr. Westgate. Leave the Tennessee Central to me, Mr. Beaumont. Some day we'll target over and I guess we can make it square. "'but I didn't know you Englishmen ever did any work in the upper classes.' "'Oh, we do a lot of work, don't we, Lambeth?' asked Percy Beaumont. "'I must certainly be home by the 19th of September,' said the younger Englishman, irreverently but gaily. "'For the shooting, eh? Or is it the hunting or the fishing?' inquired his entertainer. "'Oh, I must be in Scotland,' said Lord Lambeth, blushing a little. "'Well, then,' rejoined Mr. Westgate, "'you had better amuse yourself first, also. "'We must go down and see Mrs. Westgate.' "'We should be so happy if you could kindly tell us the train,' said Percy Beaumont. "'It isn't a train. It's a boat.' "'Oh, I see. And what is the name of, uh, the, uh, town?' "'It isn't a town,' said Mr. Westgate, laughing. "'It's a, well, what shall I call it? It's a watering place. In short, it's Newport. "'You'll see what it is. It's cool. That's the principal thing. "'You will greatly oblige me by going down there and putting yourself into the hands of Mrs. Westgate. "'It isn't perhaps for me to say it.' but you couldn't be in better hands. Also in those of her sister, who is staying with her. She is very fond of Englishmen. She thinks there is nothing like them. Mrs. Westgate, or uh, her sister? asked Percy Beaumont modestly, yet in the tone of an inquiring traveller. Oh, I mean my wife, said Mr. Westgate. I don't suppose my sister-in-law knows much about them. She has always led a very quiet life. She has lived in Boston. Percy Beaumont listened with interest. That, I believe, he said, is a most... Uh, intellectual town. I believe it's very intellectual. I don't go there much, responded his host. 
"'I say, we ought to go there,' said Lord Lambeth to his companion. "'Oh, Lord Lambeth, wait till the great heat is over,' Mr. Westgate interposed. "'Boston in this weather would be very trying. "'It's not the temperature for intellectual exertion. "'At Boston, you know, you have to pass an examination at the city limits, "'and when you come away they give you a kind of degree.' "'Lord Lambeth stared, blushing a little, "'and Percy Beaumont stared a little also, "'but only with his fine natural complexion.' glancing aside after a moment to see that his companion was not looking too credulous, for he had heard a great deal of American humour. "'I dare say it's very jolly,' said the younger gentleman. "'I dare say it is,' said Mr. Westgate. "'Only I must impress upon you that at present, tomorrow morning, at an early hour, you will be expected at Newport. We have a house there. Half the people in New York go there for the summer. I'm not sure that at this very moment my wife can take you in. She has got a lot of people staying with her. I don't know who they all are, only she may have no room.' "'but you can begin with the hotel, and meanwhile you can live at my house. "'In that way, simply sleeping at the hotel, you will find it tolerable. "'For the rest, you must make yourself at home at my place. "'You mustn't be shy, you know. "'If you are here only for a month, that will be a great waste of time. "'Mrs. Westgate won't neglect you, and you had better not try to resist her. "'I know something about that. "'I expect you'll find some pretty girls on the premises. "'I shall write to my wife by this afternoon's mail, "'and tomorrow morning she and Miss Alden will look out for you.' You just walk straight in, and she'll make yourself comfortable. Your steamer leaves right from this part of the city, and I will immediately send out and get you a cabin. Then, at half-past four o'clock, just call for me here, and I will go with you, and put you on board. It's a big boat. You might get lost. A few days hence, at the end of the week, I will come down to Newport and see how you are getting on. End of part one. Recorded by Alex Foster in Nottingham, England, on the 3rd of October, 2005 www.alexfoster.me.uk